first of all, thanks a lot for the invitation and congratulations to the four uh, winners of the Sign Life Prize. Uh, I thought it was amazing presentations, a uh, lot of originality and innovation. And uh, I think uh, when you are selected to the panel for weird people, then you know you're doing well. <laughs> I think that's the way it should be. So uh, I'm also going to uh, talk about uh, finding one's way, but uh, in a slightly different space, maybe a simpler space. Uh, and uh, I will particularly focus on uh, not how we find our way, but actually the step before that, how do we know where we are? Uh, because um, there has been a lot of progress in uh, neuroscience uh, over the last decades, and uh, one of the areas where there has been uh, particularly much progress is uh, the area of um, um, cortical systems, or uh, cortex is uh, the sheet that covers uh, the brain, where we think that most of the intellectual activity takes place. And uh, one of the functions of the cortex that is uh, maybe a little bit easier to understand than other functions is space, because it can be easily studied in animals, uh, and uh, animals, or at least mammalian animals, uh, do it pretty much in the same way as we humans do. So um, it's a fairly easy way into the cortex. But let us step back a little bit first and ask, uh, because we often take space for granted that we find our way, um, but let's ask, what would it be like if you didn't have this ability? Uh, so uh, I want to start by showing a movie um, in, on the next slide, which uh, illustrates um, um, the development of this uh, function of the brain. and. Um, also, uh, in a very simplified manner, uh, tries to explain in two minutes uh, what uh, is taking place in this area of neuroscience today. So please start the movie. And turn down slight, please, if it's possible. Uh, sound. It navigates. <laughs> Life forms develop and change over time. Abilities and traits that prove useful for survival are retained across generations through the succession of species from the common ancestor to its progeny. These are the mechanisms of evolution. Natural selection has favored the species with the best ability to navigate. An organism that moves can escape from danger and find shelter. Navigation also allows us to actively find food. The safety of a flock. Or a suitable mate. Scientists have discovered a navigation system in the brain that is common for mammalian species as diverse as bats, rats, mice, monkeys, and even humans. These discoveries suggest that this positioning system evolved from a common ancestor of mammals or earlier. We all share this system. So, where is this uh, navigation system? Well, uh, this shows the human brain, and uh, there are particularly two areas that are uh, important for this system. First of all, and the best known one, is the hippocampus, which is the area shown in red here, uh, where, let's see, is there a pointer? Well, this one, maybe. yeah, okay. Um, so this is, uh, hippocampus is in the medial temporal lobe. It's sort of inside, not on the surface, but it's still cortex. And uh, this area has been known for its role in uh, memory, particularly, but it also has turned out that this is part of the positioning system. And a second system, uh, more recently investigated, where much of my own interest and work has been, is in the entorhinal cortex, the blue area, which is uh, strongly connected to the red area, namely the hippocampus. But these areas in the human brain are 
quite hard to study. Uh, the human brain has uh, something like uh, uh, 10 to the 11th of uh, neurons or, and 10 to the 15th of uh, connections, so that um, finding uh, among all these neurons and connections, those that are relevant at any given millisecond of what's going on is extremely hard. So we need to try to simplify a little bit. And one way to approach that uh, uh, goal is to use simpler systems because uh, humans are, as you saw, not the only ones, uh, only species that uh, need space. Actually, every species needs to every species needs to solve that problem to survive. So instead of studying the human brain with its almost 100 billion neurons, we can go to simpler brains. For example, the rat brain with only 200 million, or a mouse brain with only 71 uh, million. And if our goal is not um, navigation in the sense we humans do, we can go even further, and sometimes even down to the only 302 neurons of the nematode C elegans. So you can use the whole range, and uh, you can learn a lot about how the nervous system is organized from much simpler species. But um, in our case, we are interested in how the cortex works, how the mammalian cortex works, which is uh, admittedly somewhat different from the nervous system of uh, C. elegans. So uh, the cortex consists uh, of several layers, often six layers, as you can see here, uh, and even sub-layers, but the general organization is pretty similar, at, at least across all uh, mammals, even slightly beyond, um, so that and that is both about how it's built up, but also how uh, the type, what types of neurons exist in each of the components or layers, how they interact, and how they, uh, uh, what makes them uh, uh, have particular activity patterns in relation to the outside world. So um, instead of studying the human brain, we can then just go uh, to find uh, some intermediate solution, which. Uh, uh, has been, uh, to a large extent, uh, the rodents. Rats first, uh, and now much more mice. But uh, in terms of how the navigation system works, and many other parts of cortex work, uh, there aren't huge differences. So, um, this is partly historical, because the rat has been studied in experimental psychology for at least 100 years, very intensely. But it's also uh, quite convenient that rodents are really good at finding their way. So, um, it's, uh, it's one of the reasons why uh, uh, John O'Keefe, who, um, with whom we shared a, a prize in 2014, uh, already um, before 1970 started to record activity from individual neurons in the hippocampus, the red structure that I showed on one of the first slides in uh, the rat hippocampus. And um, he did that while having rats walk around in boxes or mazes, apparatus of different types, walking freely, doing whatever they wanted, but they were slightly hungry, so that they ran for whatever food he put out there. And at the same time, he then recorded activity from the hippocampus, from individual neuron, using small, small wires that are, or electrodes that are inserted into the brain and can pick up the electrical discharges of individual neurons. This then goes to an oscilloscope, or today to a computer, is stored and can be analyzed afterwards. So, what did O'Keefe observe. That comes here. So what you now will see quite soon uh, is uh, a movie of a rat walking around in a box. The box is about one by one meter. You see it from the top. And the rat is collecting small chocolate pieces. They like that, so they will run around and visit every possible place during approximately 10 minutes. And we will be watching the rat as it runs around. At the same time, you will listen to the electrical discharges of one single cell in the hippocampus, a so-called place cell, um, and uh, you will see red dots coming up on the screen when the cell is electrically active, or fires action potential. So please start the movie. Okay. 
So you now see that the cell is active only when the rat uh, is up in the left, uh, upper left corner of the box. Otherwise, it is pretty silent. Actually, totally silent. No action potentials, no, no uh, electrical impulses. So you can see why O'Keefe called these cells place cells, because they're active only at certain places in the environment. There were many such cells, so I'll just show uh, uh, a color version of the same. This is uh, red means high activity, blue means uh, low activity. So some cells uh, he found were active at this place, other places were active here, down here, or in the middle, or yet others were active in the bottom right, and so on. And then uh, um, among the many hundreds of thousands of uh, hippocampal cells, uh, then um, there seemed like a pretty large proportion of them actually were active at specific places, and he then called those cells place cells. So this was in the 1970s. Um, then, by the end of that uh, decade, uh, O'Keefe, to the left here, together with Lynn Nedell, uh, suggested or formed a, a conceptual framework of um, the function of place cells. So what he suggested, based on uh, literature from psychology uh, some decades earlier, was that the hippocampus is a kind of uh, center, or place cells are uh, an element of uh, an internal map in the brain, a map of our space in our location, our own location in the environment. So then several decades passed, a lot was learned about place cells, and now we get to 2005, when uh, um, a few years before that, then in our lab, Maybrit uh, and I uh, investigated um, the neural basis of that other area that you saw on the slide over the human brain, namely the blue area called entorhinal cortex, which is of, to some extent con consider, considered as the main cortical input area to the hippocampus. So it's one step before place cells. And uh, so we went one step up in the superficial layers of that structure and try to find the origins of the play cells, because we really wanted to understand how come these play cells come about. Because that, to us, was a deep mystery. How can you get such a specific signal in so deep in the brain? Because it is far away from the sensory inputs. Uh, and you have no sense uh, of space, right? You, you don't have space in your fingers or ears or... Uh, Eyes. So this is generated in the brain. So how can that happen? Well, one way to try to understand that is to go to the neighboring areas, uh, to the upstream areas, and see if there's any things in the inputs that perhaps can explain what you see in the hippocampus. And what we found then, we did exactly the same. Let rats walk around in this box again, uh, and then um, recorded first the uh, position on the rat, so the position is the gray trace here. The gray trace is where the rat walked during 30 uh, minutes. So you can see that the rat really ran around and visited every possible place of that box. It, this box is two, uh, two, 220 each way. Um, then we recorded cells. And now what you see are similar dots as in the previous movie, but now they are black. And you can see there are certain areas where the cell is very active, but it is one particular cell, and you can see that it is active at many places. And those places are not randomly distributed. They actually form a very, very regular pattern, a hexagonal or triangular pattern that repeats, oops, repeats itself. Um, where you can see, you can see this, I put these red lines on top here just to illustrate uh, the periodic nature of the signal. So it forms a grid that covers the entire environment, uh, available environment, and for that reason we then call these cells uh, grid cells. Um, and um, so these cells contain information about position, that contain also information about about uh, distances, namely expressed in the distance between the active positions, and about orientation. So all that is contained in these cells. And if you have many of those cells, you can actually very precisely decode position from the population activity. So um, 
turned out that uh, there were grid cells came in different varieties, and one of the varieties was that uh, uh, they um, were different in the scale of the cells, so that um, if this is the medial entorhinal, entorhinal cortex, uh, the blue area um, of a rat brain, rat brain seen from the side, then if you begin at the top here, you typically have only small scale grids, and as you go down, the scale gets bigger, bigger and bigger, bigger. That means that the distance, the size of the individual peaks gets bigger, and the distance between them also gets bigger. So there are many scales. We ask them whether is this a gradual, um, oh, wrong again, gradual. Um, Gradual um, scale change, or are there actually different uh, components, each with a different scale? And it then turned out to be the latter, uh, as you see here. So this is a recording from one rat that had some 50, 60 grid cells. What you can see on the x-axis here is the position from top to bottom, so top here, bottom down there. So you go from top here to bottom down here. Each dot is one cell. Uh, on the y-axis, you have the size of the grid. That means the distance between the peaks. Um, so from 40 centimeters, which was the smallest in this case, up to 100, approximately 110. Um, and then you can see that as you go from top to bottom, yes, the, as we knew, the distance or the scale increases. But what you also see is that there is actually a step-like increase, and that the, these grid cells consist of uh, different modules, uh, four in this case, uh, with most of the cells in the smallest module, and then uh, as you go down, you get uh, new modules added without really losing the smallest ones. And um, this... Um, this um, organization, let's see if I have a country member, yeah, uh, actually has a specific, specific um, scale change too, in the sense that as you begin on the smallest scale here, we call that module one, you get the size of the second one simply by multiplying by factor, in this case 1.42 on average, uh, and then if you go from module 2 to 3, you get the th third one by multiplying again by 1.4, and then the fourth one again by one, uh, multiplying by 1.4. So you actually have a geometric pr progression here, which is a kind of organization that uh, is actually quite efficient in terms of uh, if you want to uh, decode position from a minimum number of uh, neurons with maximum precision. So... Um, I want to say one thing more about grid cells versus place cells, because they are two different place codes. So whereas place cells, um, if you begin to the right, place cells uh, can be illustrated by many different maps, because uh, if you are in different rooms, in this lecture room, or in the coffee area outside, or if you're outside the building, then place cells are always active, but the combination of active cells is uniquely different in each place. It's so different, it's as different as it can be uh, by, by chance. Um, and that helps us to store different maps of different places so that you don't mix them up in, uh, in any easy way. And usually that works pretty well. So you, you, when you're here, you don't believe that you're outside, you're here. Um, that is extremely, uh, it's very strongly related to memory, and that's why hippocampus is also very important for memory. Uh, but the grid map is quite different in that sense, because uh, if, you, um, if, you ask, if you record many grid cells at the same time, you will see they have a certain relationship. So some have their dots at exactly the same places, some have their dots uh, in opposite phases, that means that they fire uh, one cell fires when the other cell is silent, so they have all kinds of relationships. But those relationships are retained from one environment to the other. That means you use the same grid map in this room, out in the coffee area, or outside. It's just one map that's used over and over and over again, uh, which is probably what you want if you want to decode position in terms of uh, centimeters, meters, angles, for a measurement system, you don't want to copy that 1,000 or 100 million times for all the places you have been. You just want to use the same system each place. And then you can rather feed that system into the hippocampus and then uh, use the same metrics but store different maps for every possible environment that you want to remember. That's the way, uh, the way we think about the difference between the two systems today. But let me then add that... Uh, 
It turned out then that uh, grid cells are certainly not alone in this area. So already in 1985, it became uh, known by Jim Rank. He found that there are cells that, uh, not in entorhinal cortex, but in a neighboring area, cells that encode the, uh, the direction of, uh, of uh, mm, the rat. So you can see they have no particular area that they prefer, not very much at least. But if you plot their firing activity as a function of the rat's direction in a polar plot like here, you'll see this cell is only active when the rat goes to the left or to the left here. And this cell is only active when the cell rat goes to the upper left or to the upper left here uh, again. So um, there are directional cells. We believe they operate quite much as a kind of compass. There are also other cells, like these uh, border cells that we find in 2008, which are active only when the rat is at one border, along one wall of the environment. Uh, in different rooms, it may be in different borders. If you add a border, it may even get field there. But they definitely, explicitly, are active only when the rat is at the end of the local environment, which is also useful for a navigation system to know. And then, there are yet other cells that are active in relation to the speed of the animal. So this is when the rat is running around. In gray background here, you have the speed, the changing speed of the rat as it's walking around in the box. So look, for example, at the, the, the one here with yellow. In gray is the speed of the animal. In yellow, you have the firing rate or the activity of one particular cell. And you can see how closely it follows the speed. And several others here, the, each color is a different cell. Several others also follow the speed pretty closely. So uh, you have your own speedometer in this system. So of course, speed is not generated there, but is received from other parts of the brain, uh, probably far deep in the brainstem. But it comes up there, and it's very useful information for any map to know if the map uh, should be dynamic, be updated all the time as we move around. Then it needs uh, instantaneous information about both direction, as you saw, and speed. So that's where we were um, uh, quite uh, a few years ago, or actually just one or two years ago. So we now know there are several cell types, grid cells and so on, that are um, expressed uh, in uh, rodents. But is this unique for rodents? Well, no. One of the first indications was uh, that it wasn't like that was when uh, grid cells were found in, uh, in bats. And bats are on a different branch of uh, the evolutionary tree for uh, mammals. So this is uh, a phylogenetic tree for mammals. You have different mammals here. You have rodents up on this branch. But bats are not small rats. They're not small mice. They are actually on a completely different branch. Yet they have grid cells with very similar properties, so that, uh, that suggests that grid cells probably arose pretty early during mammalian re evolution. And then, as predicted, you find such cells with somewhat different properties, but still uh, in monkeys and now also in uh, humans. So then, for the remaining uh, few minutes, is it six minutes or something like that, I want to very quickly uh, go through two sets of new data, just to indicate where we are today. So the first is uh, a limitation of what uh, I have shown you so far, is that these data are all collected in empty boxes. But our environments are full of um, objects, things, flowers, uh, computers, chairs, and so on. So how does a navigation system take that into account? And that's a question that Evan Heidel, a PhD student in our lab, uh, is currently investigating. Um, it's based on, um, uh, on previous work, behavioral work, psych psychology work, where it has been shown that uh, animals actually are able to use the position of discrete landmarks, objects, in an environment. So this is a cylinder where the rat is walking around, two objects. A uh, rat learns to, to find uh, food at a, a particular position related to those two objects. Then those two objects are displaced away from each other. Where does the rat search? Instead of searching in the middle, actually search at the same distance from those, each of those two objects, uh, showing that the uh, rats actually use, uh, encode vectors relative to individual objects to decode or to infer position. And that has been then suggested there must be cells that take care of this. They haven't been found but now we think we have found them. So this shows an example of such a cell. Uh, this is uh, a cylinder, a rat or a mouse. This is actually a mouse walking around in that box. 
Uh, here's an object, a Lego tower, and this is an example of a cell that fires not at the object, but at a certain distance away and a certain direction away. So um, we call those, because they have always a certain direction and distance away from the object, we call them object uh, vector cells. And uh, here shows, I show them have more examples. So what you can see here is again, same cylinder, but now with multiple objects in different places. So here are two objects, here are three, here are one, two, three, four, five, six. And you can see that those cells are active always on the same side in the same distance uh, away from the object. So this is always on the left side of the two objects. This is always on the upper left side of each of those objects, regardless of where you put the objects or what they look like. So um, it suggests that these cells actually uh, provide the brain with a vector, uh, or a, a vector um, representation of uh, the rat's own, po or the mouse's own position relative to those uh, objects. And that's exactly uh, what was predicted actually some 20 years ago uh, based on behavioral work. Um, I suggest that not only does this area of the brain actually encode position relative to the global framework, but it actually uses also a separate set of cells to encode position relative to discrete landmarks in the local environment. So that was the one new thing. The other new thing, which I will uh, spend less time on, is much more complicated, so I will just give you a, a very simple um, overview. But this is um, the encoding of time, because, as I said, this is work of, uh, and this is work of Albert Sau, another uh, uh, PhD student, now postdoc, uh, uh, who was with us. Um, the starting point is that the hippocampus, the red area I showed in the beginning, is also important for storing memories, episodic memories, memories about what you experience. And when you experience something, yes, there's a lot of space. Space is always a component, but there's also time. You have to encode time when things happen and how they are relative to each other. But we don't know how time is encoded. So uh, to begin with that, what we have done is to look for cells that signal time. And that's not so easy to find. It's not like grid cells or object vector cells that you simply see the encoding of time, only in very rare cases. But if you record a population activity, many, many cells at the same time, and do that over time. So he recorded in boxes, 11 uh, experiments, or who is it, 10? 10, 12, 11 uh, experiments where he recorded either in a black or a white box over time. And then uh, he did the principal vector, uh, principal component analysis on this data and found uh, uh, the, the way, best way to project this data and saw that there was clustering. Um, what he found first is that in, in three different brain areas, lateral entorhinal cortex, which we haven't talked about yet, CA3 is hippocampus, and medial entorhinal is where you have the grid cells. Then in some of these areas, you find clusters that correspond to uh, the, the color of the box. So that is kind of consistent with what we know. But the message here is that in these uh, PCAs, so, uh, you also actually find a representation of when the recording was taken during this sequence. Sequence. So if you um, plot this with one dot in this diagram for each 10 seconds, you can actually see that there is a development uh, of where in this space uh, the activity takes place that goes on in such a way that you can decode subsequently when a recording happened. And such decoding was exactly what Albert did. So just to be very quick, this shows the result of the decoding. He could use then a machine learning technique, train a network based on data, and guess for remaining data um, when, was the, uh, when was the recording taken in blocks of 10 seconds over a period of more than one hour. And he could guess, actually, in, with a limited number of cells, approximately 50 cells, he could guess in half of the cases uh, for lateral entorhinal cortex and for the other areas not so well. But uh, if he added, increased the number of cells, as you can see here, in this area, lateral entorhinal cortex, you get almost up to 100% hits. That means you can, from the combined activity, tell exactly when the activity took place. So there is a kind of recording of time there. Let's skip that. Uh, you can even see it sometimes in individual cells. You see the, the activity going up and down uh, during each recording in the black or the white box or over the whole uh, time of uh, the testing. Um, but um, 
what's perhaps most interesting is that this recording of time, this uh, representation of time, is uh, adjustable so that if you train the rat to walk in, the, in tasks, which it does over and over and over again, for example, run through a, an eight-shape uh, maze like this, they learn how to do it, then what happens is that you get a change in this time representation in the brain. So now you have only one big cluster, so you can't really distinguish anything anymore. But what you find is that you can now decode the time within each test in this box. So imagine you do 10 tests in this uh, environment, uh, 10 times, and then each time you begin, you put the rat in, uh, and it runs like in a figure eight uh, pattern over and over again for, let's say, five, sec five minutes. Then you take it away, and you do it another time, and then you do it 10 times. So now that the rat learns this task, the representation of time uh, changes so that you can now decode time within each uh, each trial, but you uh, in in the lateral entorhinal cortex, but uh, are not so much when you uh, much much better than you did when it was just running freely around. But you can't tell whether it's the first or the second or the third or the fourth uh, session in this task. So actually, the whole representation of time takes into account uh, the l new learned tasks and scales time in relation to that instead. So I think with that, we are uh, on the track of uh, something interesting, namely that there is a co encoding of time. It's much more, much less accessible because it distributes it across so many cells. And in order to find uh, the codes, the algorithms that take place there, I think we actually need to use new techniques uh, we need to record from many, many cells at the same time, and then, most importantly of all, not only have the data, but actually find ways to analyze the data and find the underlying algorithms. And then, finally, just to show one way to approach that, I will show, I will start the movie, last about one minute, and fr from then, uh, after that, I'm completely done. This mouse has a miniature microscope called a miniscope on its head. The miniscope allows us to peer into the mouse's brain to observe the activity of the cells as the mouse navigates its environment. We connect the microscope to a computer using a cable and allow the mouse to explore the box. What we see on the screen now are some hundred neurons at the surface of the brain in the area of the entorhinal cortex. These neurons are labeled with a fluorescent molecule that makes the cells glow when they spike. Within the window that we image now, there are hundreds of grid cells. We are interested in finding out how the capacity to navigate is produced in the brain. To study this, we investigate how cells communicate at the neural network level. The miniscope enables us to study the activity of individual cells, as well as cascades and patterns of activity through the entire network. While the miniscope is a lower resolution microscope, we can use a two-photon microscope to study the cells in detail. Here we see the dendritic spines of a grid cell. Shifting the focal point, we can move through the neural tissue. This imaging tool allows us to investigate volumetric neural networks in greater detail. And just to have that said, this uh, technique is not invented by us, but we are applying it for a new function. And uh, I think, uh, like what we heard yesterday, for example, there is also here an enormous uh, development in resolution. So I, I think we have great hopes for for this and similar techniques uh, that for picking up activity from not only hundreds, but actually many thousands of cells at the same time.